Growing in Love, Galatians chapter 5 and Luke chapter 7. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And today, from the scripture read to us in Luke, we're going to be learning about how the Holy Spirit grows love within us and produces that delicious fruit that we can share with others. Now, as a child in the uh, 60s, I grew up with the Beatles singing out, all you need is love. And that was great until someone goes and spoils it all by saying, hang on a minute, just what exactly is love? Well, if I was a poet, I could answer love is a many splendid thing. And that it is. But the trouble is that with all the poets and the playwrights and the musicians, every man and his dog, they've got hold of this word and used it so often and in so many ways that we're just left wondering what it is that they're talking about. I mean, I love jelly babies. I could also say, I love my wife. I hope you see that I mean two different things by that. And when a word means everything, then it can actually come to mean nothing. English is quite a barren language when it comes to talking about love, which is perhaps why traditionally we resort to French as the language of romance. But uh, the New Testament Greek the language the New Testament was written in, that itself has a a richer vocabulary, at least three words for love. So if, like foreigner, you're saying, I want to know what love is, then perhaps it would be a good thing to think about these three words just for a moment. Firstly, there's the word eros. That's a familiar word to it, to us. It's the word we get the word erotic from. It's about need love, it's about grasping love. Perhaps best described as candlelit dinners with the lingering touch of the fingers. It's about the deep kiss. It's about that love that seeks sensual gratification. It's the kind of love we talk about when we say making love. It is eros that leads to that feeling of falling in love with all the gooey bits that go with it. But any relationship needs more than eros if it's to be well grounded. Eros, as someone has said, can soon wear as thin as the negligee that represents it. Philia is on a higher plane than eros because it always involves being interested in the other person, not for what they can give, but for who they are. It's about companionship and friendship, enjoying each other's company. It's about turning off the television to talk to each other. It's about feeling lonely when the other one is away. It's a dynamic word, inferring a deliberate overcoming of all the forces that work for separation in a relationship. Eros may bring people together in brief romantic and emotional encounters, but without philia, without friendship, sooner or later that relationship will flounder. And yet there is another word for love, and that is agape. Agape is the highest form of love we can ever experience. Agape is the way that God loves It is this way of loving that Paul describes when he he wrote that famous song of love in 1 Corinthians 13. It is love, agape love, that is patient and kind. It is agape that's not jealous or conceited or proud. Agape that keeps no record of wrongs, but that never gives up, that is eternal. Love is agape, according to Paul. And by his living and dying, Jesus demonstrates this self-giving love. Love for neighbours, not just for self. Love for enemies, not just for friends. The the for better, for worse kind of love that goes on loving, even when its uh, subject has become unlovable. And the Christian gospel declares that by virtue of his resurrection from the dead, Jesus is alive today and is able by the power of his Holy Spirit to produce his love in our hearts. He is the example of love, and yet he's also the power of love. 
The fruit of the Spirit is love. This is what God wants to grow in us. Not eros, not even just philia, but the real unselfish, unbending, unending, cross-shaped agape. Now there's no doubt that we see an outpouring of this lavish and costly love from the woman we meet in Simon's house in Luke chapter 7. In similar anointing accounts in the other Gospels, the disciples and others criticise her deeply for the waste. The ointment, it could have been sold and hundreds of poor people fed. Here in Luke, it's not so much the waste that is criticised, but Jesus for not realising just exactly what kind of a woman it was who was doing this to him. Yet the evidence is that Jesus knew perfectly well who this woman was and what she had been forgiven, just as much as he knew exactly what the Pharisee was thinking and how little in comparison, if at all, he loved. Those who have been forgiven much will love much. That's the point Jesus is wanting to make. So let's uh, think for a moment about love, this kind of agape love, this outward pouring out love, sacrificial love. And let's think about how it grows as we consider this passage from Luke 7 and the unnamed woman described in it. And let's do that uh, as I share three stories with you. The first story is uh, how uh, my best childhood friend became my friend. When I was young, before the days of computers and digital gaming, every Christmas Santa bought us a tube of sweets and on the end of that uh, tube of sweets was a, a puzzle that was on the top. It got a little ball bearing in it uh, that you had to carefully manoeuvre up a track and then drop into a hole in the middle. Do you remember them? Anyway, at grammar school, my friend at that point was just a classmate and he was fast becoming a celebrity in the class because he had one of these toys with him and every break for days on end we'd gather around and each of us would hope to be the one being the one who'd get it up the track and into the hole. The puzzle became my friend's prized possession. One day I thought about this as I asked him what he would do if someone happened to drop and break it. I think I would cry, he said. Now I don't know what came over me, but I just happened to be holding the thing at the time and yes, you've guessed it. I don't know who was more shocked by what I did in that moment, whether it was him or, or me. I do know that I went home that night, took a bicycle to pieces to find the right size ball bearing. I got it out and Airfix glued the plastic together and tried my best to put it as new. Next day, I humbly presented my shabby efforts to my friend and we never played with that thing ever again. But from that moment on, Ian and I were best friends. It was a friendship that began with forgiveness and grew into a deep love based on repentance and grace and gratitude. There are some who will say that a true friend never hurts you. Well, I'm sorry, sometimes they do. But true friends will seek forgiveness and they will give it too. That's what this woman found as the basis of her friendship with Jesus. It was a love that grew out of her finding forgiveness. She felt the power of it that was so strong she was overcome with emotion. And when her tears wet for Jesus' feet, she compounded the situation by letting her hair down to use as a towel. And then she'd pour oil over his feet instead of anointing his head, as was the expected custom. Simon could only see what this woman had been and interpret her actions as erotic and unseemly. 
But Jesus saw them and received them for what they truly were. Incompetent maybe, but still a genuine overflowing of love so great because so much had been forgiven. Now this second story may or may not be true. Parts of it may be wishful thinking on my part, but the gist of it is sound. See, when I was young, all the girls were queuing up to catch me. I started going out with Jill before going away to study. And various times while I was away, other girls seemed to attach themselves hopefully to me. I found it very gratifying and some of them were worth consideration. But each time I was tempted, I was stopped short in my wandering tracks with a question I asked myself. And the question was this, if these girls knew me like Jill knows me, would they still love me like she does? Jill and I grew up together and we knew each other well, so well that Jill had got to know even the very worst about me. Not just the nice little bits I like people to see, but knowing the worst, she still loved me. That, I decided, was true love and I'm so glad I stuck with it. Now Simon made a big deal of uh, if he only knew the type of person she is. His assumption was that a holy man would both be able to discern her character and then shun her completely. It was wrong on both counts. Jesus did know the very worst about her, just as he poignantly revealed that which he knew was the very worst of Simon. But knowing the worst of her, he loved her just the same, accepted her offering, not as the misplaced act of a fallen woman, but as a genuine outpouring of love and gratitude. I'm intrigued by another woman of ill repute in the New Testament, the woman who Jesus met at the well in Samaria. Finding herself loved and accepted by Jesus, despite him knowing full well what her history was, well, what does she do then? But she runs off and calls everyone to come and what is it? Meet the man who told me everything I ever did. I don't know about you, but I'm not so sure I'd want people to know all of that. If my life could be ployed out on a screen for all to see, I'd be mortified. But not this woman. She knew Jesus knew it all, but still loved and accepted her. By grace and forgiveness, her past lost its power over her. She could now grow to be something beautiful for God. Because those who have been forgiven much will love much. Have you come to the place of knowing Jesus really does know everything about you? The worst as well as the best, but he still loves and accepts you. Have you truly found his grace and forgiveness so that your past no longer holds a grip over you? And so gratitude fills and directs your life. Come to this place, for it's the best place for love to grow. The third story is a story from a film. I saw it on TV not so long ago, catching a bit of it after an elders meeting. It was called something like The Terror Within, which struck me as being rather appropriate after an elders meeting. It was all about a nice woman who went madly berserk. Seriously, it was a film about a terrible thing. The woman, it turned out, had been seriously abused as a child by her father. Now married with, a child, with children of her own, the suppressed shame and pain was working itself out. She was developing multiple personalities, one of whom was a prostitute with no shame at all, deliberately being disgusting and hateful, playing with guns and knives. 
And all these personalities, they were hell-bent on destroying each other and anyone else who would get close to them, like a husband and like a doctor. I didn't see all of the film, but I caught bits, including the final scene. There was this other personality trying to kill Susie, trying to kill herself. But there also was the doctor and the husband who, who despite everything, had not given up. Suddenly her eyes were opened and she saw them and she sobbed. Turning to her husband, she said, Are you still here? Do you still love me after everything I've done? The answer was a silent one and an acted out one. As he crawled over to her, held her in his arms and she sobbed. Finally, the silence was broken as the husband looked over to ask, what now, Doc? And the film ended with the words, now the healing begins. Now Simon expected a prophet, a holy person, to shun this woman, not to accept her. But Jesus did not do that. There was nothing in what she had done that would make him, make him turn away from her. Nothing at all. He accepted her love. And when she came to him, she found nothing but love and forgiveness from him. This is the gospel. There is perhaps a hurting child in every one of us, yet however our self-destruct button is triggered and whatever it causes it to be so, the Lord who sticks with us is waiting to save us. And when we ask, do you still love me after everything I've done? The sign language tells it all. As he quietly reaches out his nailed, scarred hands, and embraces us. Mary Magdalene was the first to see this. She'd been there in Herod's courtyard while Jesus was whipped and falsely tried. She'd been there at Calvary watching with her own eyes as a crazy world threw every destructive power it could at the Saviour. She followed and saw where he was buried. And then on Easter Sunday, she was the first to see him risen and alive again. The first messenger of this marvellous good news. Are you still here after everything we've done to you? You bet I am, says the risen Jesus. Realise this, accept this, that he knows you. You can't hide anything from him. Receive his grace and forgiveness and know that nothing in heaven and on earth, nothing in your past or present circumstances, nothing in the future yet to come can ever separate you from his love. Know this. And as then, as those who have first been loved, go and love in return. Amen.